So first off, thank you all for coming out today. When I was uh, stepping outside at my house and seeing that terrible rain, I was thinking to myself, I probably wouldn't have come out to a talk tonight. So I really appreciate all of you coming. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Susie Dunn. I'm a law professor here at the Schulich uh, School of Law. I teach uh, contracts law and I also teach an upper year law and technology and intellectual property law course. Uh, but my main area of research is looking at technology facilitated gender-based violence, which is a mouthful of a term, um, but we'll, we'll walk through um, what I mean by that term and go over some of the different um, laws and, uh, and ways that people have been hoping to address tech facilitated violence as it emerges in its different forms online. So for what we'll cover today, we'll start with criminal law and go over some of the criminal laws um, that exist. We'll look at historical ones that you can apply to tech facilitated violence and also some that have been developed specifically for tech violence and talk about some of the pros and cons that come with using a criminal response um, to addressing these types of harms, um, which we'll also do for the civil and non-legal options. Um, next, we'll talk about civil responses. There's all sorts of civil responses that you can use to address tech violence. One of the ones that's commonly used for nude images is copyright, um, because there's a lot of um, uh, protection for copyright on the internet in comparison to harmful behavior. So it can actually be a more effective tool compared to using regular civil torts or statutes and getting an effective remedy. And then we'll talk about some of the non-legal responses as well, because with any sort of harm that we're thinking of in society, law is typically the last place that people go when they want to get um, supports for things. Often they're going to family and friends first, or they're going to um, NGOs or they're going to schools and so often the law is the last place to go to so I think it's quite important to think about non-legal options and also the ways that our governments can support those non-legal options. So I'm just going to take my mask off because it's a bit breathy. Okay so the first thing we'll touch on is criminal law. Oh no I'll talk, I'll, I'll talk first about what we mean by tech facilitated gender-based violence. So this is a term um, uh, Jane Bailey, uh, Nicola Henry, and Asher Flynn have coined uh, this, this term, tech facilitated violence. Some other organizations have used it as well. But essentially, it's an umbrella term to describe any sort of digital technology um, that's used to perpetrate interpersonal harassment, abuse, or violence. Um, generally, when we're talking about gender-based uh, tech facilitated violence, we're looking at people who've been impacted by this harm who might be marginalized or a part of an equality seeking group because of their gender identity or their gender expression. So a lot of history of um, gender-based violence focuses a lot on women and girls who are one group of people who are impacted by this type of harm. But of course, um, uh, trans uh, people, agender, non-binary um, and gender non-conforming people are also um, impacted by tech facilitated gender-based violence. And they're usually targeted specifically because of their gender identity and expression. And what we see specifically when it comes to gender-based harms is that people are often um, targeted in very sexual ways. And so women will be threatened with rape rather than being threatened with violence, um, which is what we see more men being threatened with on the internet. And when it comes to harassing comments, um, they're often uh, focused on a person's um, gender. So talking about their body, talking about um, the way they look and how they don't fit within really restrictive, heteronormative, sexist ideals. Um, and also what we see with this type of harm, um, research shows that even when we have men and women experiencing similar levels of um, various types of tech facilitated violence, what we see is the impacts on women, trans and gender non-conforming people is that the harms that they experience are higher. So we see higher rates of mental health issues, we see higher rates of risks of physical safety, feelings of fear, um, and higher rates of suicidal ideation. So quite serious um, impacts when it comes to the gendered aspect of these types of harms. And it, it includes a lot of terms. This is a list um, that came from um, a paper which I'll, I'll speak further about by Cynthia Koo. So the um, Women's Legal Education and Action Fund, which is one of the, the best um, legal organizations dealing with gender equality in Canada, wrote a report called Deplatforming Misogyny, which is a report um, that looks at a feminist um, interpretation of how to address uh, tech facilitated violence, specifically by moderating social media companies. And so there's been a lot of conversation legally around whether we should actually regulate 
the behavior of social media companies and their expectations around content moderation. And so there's a variety of terms on here. Some you'll be familiar with, hate speech, threats, um, impersonation. Those are all terms that most people are likely familiar with, and some where you might not be as familiar with them. Um, so things like doxing. So doxing is a term that comes from um, early days in the internet when people were dropping docs. And so generally you'd publish documents to expose some sort of issue or expose um, the identity of a person. Doxing today is mostly used to um, uh, release someone's private information. So for example, when someone's nude images are posted on a pornography site or a revenge porn site, often what will happen is they'll also post their home address, they'll post their full name, their workplace, their social media, um, information, their phone number, and their email address. Um, and that causes additional harms to the person who then has other people contacting them, asking them for sexual um, contact, or harassing them in other ways. So doxing can be a, a really troubling experience for people. And some people have actually had to do things like um, uh, change their legal name. A woman named Holly Johnson was an academic who had a sexual video of her released by her ex-boyfriend that was affiliated with her name, saying that she made it for her students, um, and there was no way she could get it off the internet, and so the solution for her was to actually legally change her name so that when you Googled the name that she was affiliated under as an academic, you wouldn't find these sexual videos of her, and other people have had to move addresses. There's a lot of trans women have been doxxed and threatened and... Um, Swatted, which is when you call the police and you call in a fake bomb threat or a fake kidnapping and the police show up at someone's house um, to arrest the person, usually heavily armed, um, which has happened recently in Canada with uh, a trans woman um, and she had to uh, flee her home because of doxing. Um, there's also the non-consensual distribution of intimate images, which again is a mouthful of a term. There's a lot of mouthy academic terms that we use here. Um, a lot of people recognize this behavior as revenge porn. That's not a term that most academics use anymore because it suggests that someone has done something deserving of revenge. Um, and then pornography is conceptualized um, by a lot of people as content that was produced to be consumed um, for um, consensually for sexual uh, pleasure, um, but uh, with non-consensual distribution of intimate images. The images have been released in a way that they're not meant to be publicly consumed. So we generally avoid that term. Uh, deepfakes is also another one that some people may have heard of but might not be familiar with. It's a use of um, AI technology where it maps out your face and then it can put it onto another video. So forms of gender-based violence where that's happened is um, often with women celebrities and politicians, their face will be superimposed onto a pornographic video to make it look as though they're engaging in sexual activity they haven't engaged in. And deepfakes used to be a little bit more glitchy. They kind of came into open source um, availability on Reddit in 2017. And at that time, you could tell, like they would be like fuzzy around their face or be fuzzy around their mouth. And you could, if you really looked at it, you could tell it was a fake uh, video. But now, uh, because it's open source, because it uses AI, the advancements in deepfakes are incredible. And really good deepfakes are, you, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a real video and a fake video. And so there was an example of a woman uh, in India who was reporting on sexual violence that the Indian government hadn't been responding too well, uh, Rana Ayub, and in response to that, a sexual deep fake was made of her and spread uh, throughout WhatsApp and Twitter to try and delegitimize her and say that she was um, someone who was engaging in salacious sexual activity that shouldn't be believed in her journalism. So it's been used in, in quite a different uh, few ways. And then sextortion is sexual extortion. Uh, so we saw a real rise of this in um, during COVID. So traditionally, most extortion has been targeted at children. So what will happen is someone will befriend a young person on the internet, pretending to be another young person. They'll get into a romantic or sexual relationship, and the young person on the other end will send a flirty or sexy photo. Um, and then that photo will be used to extort them for more content um, with threats of posting that content online. And so we saw that in the case of Amanda Todd, who was uh, a young BC woman in uh, 2012, I believe this happened to her. And there was a Dutch man who was doing this to uh, dozens of young people um, across the world. And, uh, and in her case, um, he kept releasing the photos and tormenting her over a two year period. She was also tormented by her classmates and harassed by her classmates and eventually died 
um, by suicide um, and her death and the death of Retea Parsons, which was a similar incident of photos being taken without consent, but in a live situation with some of her classmates and they were released and she was bullied and she also um, died by suicide. And th those two cases were really the first cases in Canada that brought major media attention to this issue and you started to see government response. Uh, because at the time, even though there were extortion laws, there weren't laws around the non-consensual distribution of intimate images. So what these um, men and boys were doing to these girls wasn't actually illegal. Like it might have fit in other laws, like child pornography laws, but that's not a perfect fit for it. And so, so during that time, you saw a lot more response from the government and you saw the introduction of criminal and civil torts around the non-consensual distribution of intimate images. But generally what we see with all of these forms of harms, they're really just um, old forms of gender-based violence that we've seen in the past that are now using new forms of technology to enact them. And so we saw this way back in the day with the advent of anything from faxes to cameras to uh, telephones. We used to have a specific law about the harassment of women on telephones because people would call women at night before there was um, caller ID and they'd just breathe into the phone and hang up or they'd say really creepy things and they'd hang up. So we've seen laws developed um, every time there's new technology, uh, abusive people find ways um, to use that technology to uh, continue their abuse. And, and I think that that's a really interesting and important point because one of the challenges we've seen with tech violence is that a lot of institutions like the police or, or law enforcement um, wanna separate the two and they wanna say, it's just online, it's not that harmful, just turn your phone off, just get off social media, and that's how you can av avoid these things. But what we know during COVID, like all of our lives are so deeply intertwined with technology that we can't, um, we can't separate the two. And so I actually think during COVID, a lot of people's perspectives have changed. But at the time when Retea Parsons was being bullied by her classmates, that was a lot of response she got from the police and schools and um, social workers were just saying, well, just turn it off, just ignore it. It's not really that harmful because, you know, there's there's not necessarily a, a physical impact um, to it. Um, and so so getting rid of that online offline divide. And I and I sorry, I missed my my piece about sextortion. And so sextortion during COVID really increased for men because what happened is normally sextortion is targeted at children or women. But what we found was there was an uptick for men during that time because men were alone in their houses. People were having a lot of online relationships um, and connecting with people in digital spaces. And there was actually transnational um, organizations um, that were taking advantage of men by pretending to be women, getting photos uh, and videos from them, and then extorting them not for more sexual content, but for money. And we saw that across the board. We had um, one of our members of parliament, Tony Clement, I believe it was, had this happen to him. And he's someone who had very high security clearance in the government. That didn't happen during COVID, it happened before COVID. But you see the specific targeting of men who might be a bit more willing to share sexual images um, in uh, a digital context because they're less likely to be targeted by things like non-consensual distribution. But then you saw this uptick of people finding a way to financially extort them. And so if you do this to enough men and you get $1,000 per men, you can actually make um, quite a bit of money from, uh, from sexual extortion. So there's a lot of barriers when it comes to accessing the law um, when we're dealing with tech issues. And this is across the board, not just with tech violence. So we know there is a lack of legal knowledge in the uh, legal profession. I tell all my students this all the time, like you should know about tech, you should know about social media because it's the future of law, no matter what area of law you're in. Uh, but right now, um, our generation of lawyers and even um, legal academics and judges um, really lack technical expertise and technical knowledge. And that can be a challenge on many fronts. So it can be difficult to understand how the technology works in order to be able to collect digital evidence that's admissible for legal cases. It can be difficult to explain that um, to a court, especially if you're talking to a judge who might not be familiar with the technology. Like trying to explain TikTok to someone who's never used it before can be tricky. Um, so we, we, have, we have this and, and we've seen some movements of expectations that lawyers and judges have um, an increase in their technical knowledge, which I think is really positive, but it's a slow, slow process. Um, law enforcement is the same um, um, issue. 
what we see is that a lot of the technical knowledge for law enforcement is focused on um, child abuse uh, materials because that is one of the most significant harms. Children are extraordinarily vulnerable. Um, and there's a lot of um, desire to put resources into that area. But when it comes to adults, there's a little bit less of a drive to have those resources there. And so when law enforcement are having to make decisions around where to put the few people they have with specialization in tech, um, it's not always in tech facilitated violence. And the average police officer might not know um, exactly how to collect the di digital evidence they need. And digital evidence is sensitive because you can drop your phone, you know, someone can go onto the account, they can delete it, um, you can accidentally um, wipe your Dropbox. There's all sorts of ways to lose um, digital evidence, which creates vulnerabilities for accessing um, legal responses to this type of harm. Anonymity is an issue both for the perpetrator and for the victim. So if you don't know who it is that's harassing you, it's on some anonymous account or it's been posted on Pornhub and you don't know who's posted it up there, it can be very difficult. And when it comes to criminal law, you need someone to charge. Um, so if you don't know who it is, um, that's a challenge. And so unmasking um, the perpetrator is something that um, people often rely on the police to do, but we also have to balance that with the need to protect anonymity and privacy more generally on the internet. So we have to balance giving police powers to unmasking people with also protecting the, the larger needs of privacy and an anonymity as a, a, a human right in many ways. Um, there's also the desired anonymity in the, of the victim. In the United Kingdom, when they first introduced their non-consensual distribution laws, um, if your nude image had been released and you um, went to the police or you filed a civil case, your name would be published um, in the court records. And then the newspapers would go on and they'd say, Susie Dunn has had her nude image released. It was released on this site and she's charging this person. And then that would be in the newspaper and then everyone would be able to find and view those images more, um, increasing the harm that the person's experiencing and really discouraging people from reporting. Because if the thing that you want is for people not to see these pictures um, and then you're not anonymous, um, it can cause a lot of problems. Um, in Canada, generally, you can apply for anonymity, but it's an extra um, court process if you're an adult um, that just costs a bit more money. So it, it, again, it's another barrier people face. The internet, of course, you can replicate things. You can copy things, you can save things. It's very difficult to get content off the internet. Um, one of the first cases on um, nude image sharing um, in a civil court in Canada, the lawyer um, that worked with her, I've been in contact with her and it's maybe eight or nine years later and she still um, has to pay a reputation managing company to go out and try and find those images and take them down because they're always replicated, they're always put back up. And so it's an ongoing process to get content taken down. So expediency of getting material down before it's replicated and spread across the internet is important. And the law is slow. And we all know the law is slow. And the law is slow for a lot of good reasons, but it, it creates barriers to the actual remedies that people are seeking. And then jurisdictional challenges. So in the case of Amanda Todd, the person um, who was targeting her was a Dutch citizen um, uh, living in the Netherlands. And so, you know, he actually got charged in the Netherlands first, served his sentence, and then he had to get extradited um, over to Canada and was just sentenced here in Canada, which she, she died, I believe, in 2012 or 2013. And now he's just um, uh, got sentenced this year um, in Canada. And even to figure out who he was was a challenge and then finding out he's in another country, you know, depending on the relationships that we have with certain countries, you might not even be able to get an extradition order. And, you, and that case was a really well-known case that people cared a lot about. So there was a lot of incentive um, for the government to extradite him. But in other cases, you know, sometimes they'll say, we don't know who this person is, their IP address is in Germany, you know, it's too much. It's too much work. And so, so that's a real barrier that, uh, that victims face when they're trying to seek recourse through the legal system. Criminal law, you can apply a lot of existing criminal laws. Often with tech law, people are saying, let's create new laws, we need new laws, but often you don't need new laws. You can apply existing laws. Um, when I was doing my master's and uh, PhD, I worked with the Equality Project under Professor Jane Bailey at the University of Ottawa. And we read, I read and summarized around um, 800 cases that we found in criminal law that had some elements of uh, technology and some elements of violence. And this, we, we looked at all genders of people for this. 
And we found a lot of laws could actually apply. So harassment um, applied, extortion, hate propaganda, identity fraud, which is impersonation, intimidation, and uttering threats. We, we found all of those laws applied equally. It didn't matter if it was online or uh, in person. But then we did find that the government had to create some specific laws. So voyeurism, before voyeurism existed, which is taking um, secretive um, images of people, usually for a sexual purpose, the laws that existed before that were called peeping Tom laws. And so it was trespassing at night. So if you snuck onto someone's property and looked in their window, you could get charged with an offense. But once we had hidden cameras, the person wasn't actually physically there all the time. And so they had to introduce voyeurism laws, which counts for recordings. And in countries that are a lot more technologically advanced um, than we are, like South Korea, we've seen epidemics uh, of uses of hidden cameras in change rooms, in bathrooms, in hotel rooms um, that are live streamed onto pornography sites. And so there's very few places in South Korea where people feel safe. And they've had protests of hundreds of thousands of women um, going out into the street to, to call for action on, on this type of harm because it's so common uh, and so accessible to people. The non-consensual distribution of intimate images, which is um, publishing um, intimate images um, online, often through digital means, but it can also be if you print off a copy of it and shared it with other people, it would count as well. But there was no law that fit perfectly with that offense. So that's a new one that was created following the um, Todd and Parsons uh, case. Um, and then there's things like the unlawful use of a computer. So we've had to introduce things like hacking laws that never existed before um, computers existed. A lot of the laws that are created around children um, so we have um, issues around um, child sexual abuse material, which in the criminal code is called child pornography. But again, there's been a shift in the use of how people describe the language of that. Um, and then a lot of uh, laws around luring children and showing children sexually explicit material online or inviting them for sexual contact has, has been an issue. Uh, one of the earliest issues that, that, that arose um, when, when the internet was... Uh, was invented. And, and, and a new um, issue that's been coming up that's kind of debated about whether it should be criminalized or not are unsolicited dick pics. So we've seen trends internationally where this is on the more extreme side of things where people will be on public transits and anyone who's got airdrop, any woman who's got airdrop open on their phone will just get a dick pic sent to them. And they don't know who it is, but they know it's someone on the train. And it's very scary for some people because you don't know if it's the person sitting next to you. You don't know if they're going to follow you off the train. It's a very upsetting experience. Um, but in Canada right now, we don't have any laws around that. And there's also lots of circumstances when we send unsolicited images that might not necessarily be harmful. Like typically on a dating app, you should probably ask first. The best practice is to ask first. But there might be some circumstances where an unsolicited image might still be wanted and, and might not need to be criminalized. But right now, the only law that we have for that is making sexual um, material available to a child. And it's generally like if it's an adult sending material to a child who's under a particular age, I believe it's under 14, um, for a sexual purpose. But that's another area of law that we're starting to see um, people pushing for legislation on that. And pros and cons of criminal law. So criminal law, we all know, is problematic. And what we know in particular about criminal law with gender-based violence and sexual violence is that it has not been the most effective tool for actually um, addressing sexual violence. Um, there is a lot of lack of uh, trust in the institution. Um, a lot of women are reluctant to report um, sexual offenses or gender-based violence offenses because they've had negative experiences with the police. I think there's been efforts to change, um, but, um, but that still exists. Um, there's also a historic disparate treatment of indigenous people, of black people, the LGBTQ community that might make them hesitant to use the criminal law. And also, we haven't, like when it comes to imprisoning people, it doesn't necessarily stop this type of violence. So like it might get the person out of the community, but when it comes to rehabilitation and actually changing the behavior of people, um, you know, there's very mixed results on how effective the criminal law system is in changing larger societal norms around sexual violence. Um, and, and this is inclusive of tech facilitated violence. So there's a lot of barriers that people experience there. The victim also has um, no uh, choice in the litigation strategy. Uh, the Crown is representing their interest. Um, so they don't have a lot of choice necessarily on how the case is guided compared to, to civil law. 
And then there's this term that's used a lot in um, tech facilitated violence called lawful but awful. So there's a lot of content that is terrible, that we know hurts people, that we know probably shouldn't be on the internet, but it doesn't reach the thresholds of um, criminal liability or civil liability. And so in those cases there, it's not even necessarily content that we do want criminalized, but it's content that we probably want addressed uh, for larger societal purposes, but doesn't necessarily fit within the criminal law. The benefits of using the criminal law is that if you get, um, if you report to a police station and they take your case seriously, um, the investigation is funded by the state, unlike civil law, which is very financially inaccessible for many people. Um, you don't have to worry about the, the cost. There are, of course, costs associated with it, but mostly it's funded by the state. Uh, the police can gather evidence um, in a way that the average person probably can't do. They can get warrants, they can get orders, they can get access to IP addresses that um, an individual person might not be able to get on their own. Of course, there are serious incidents that do warrant state intervention. As much as there is criticism of the criminal law system, there are some circumstances where we do want state intervention in harms um, that occur in society. And for some people, having recognition by the state that what happened to them was wrong is very important. And even though the criminal justice system is difficult to go through as a victim of sexual or gender-based violence, it's still worth it for them to go through and to have a decision at the end if they're successful um, that recognizes what happened to them was wrong. Um, civil laws are really, so a lot of people have been advocating for civil law solutions. Um, and, and we've seen real movement in that. So, so again, like criminal law, you can apply common law torts uh, to these types of harms. So intentional uh, infliction of mental suffering. There's all sorts of privacy torts that have been introduced depending on the jurisdiction that you're in, defamation um, and harassment. Harassment is not a tort in all jurisdictions. I believe it's a, a tort in uh, Alberta. And then they tried to um, bring an argument to introduce a tort of harassment in Ontario and it failed. But then a year or so later, they actually were able to bring in a tort for online harassment. But the threshold for that is extremely high. It's very malicious. It's very repeated. It's very intentional. It's very serious consequences on someone's life. But there are there have been torts that have been introduced specifically for online harms. We've also seen introduce the introduction of many statutes, particularly around um, the non-consensual distribution of intimate images. Um, here in Nova Scotia, I actually think we have one of the, the most progressive um, ones on the books. It's really broad, it's really interesting. We'll talk a bit more about it later. Um, people have already, uh, have also used uh, provincial privacy acts where there's a private right of action. Um, so in BC, um, Alberta and Quebec, um, people have used those statutes. And then PEPEDA, which is our commercial privacy um, laws, has actually been used by some of the um, individuals who were complaining about their content being posted on uh, Pornhub and not being taken down. They made a complaint to the privacy commissioner saying that their personal information was on this commercial website and this commercial website was not taking it down. And so there have been complaints to uh, commercial organizations as well. As I mentioned before, um, copyright is a tool that people can use. Um, most sexual images have been taken by the person themselves. So if you have copyrights, um, you can make a file a, a copyright complaint. In Canada, we have a notice and notice um, regime, which means um, if you uh, make a complaint, it has to be delivered to that person. They get notice and they should take action. But it's different than what we see in the United States where they have a notice and takedown regime. Um, where if you make a copyright complaint, um, the content has to be taken down immediately or else the, um, uh, the website can actually be held liable for copyright infringement themselves. Um, but if you're ever, um, if you know of anyone who's ever had their images shared without consent, because most social media companies are in America, you can actually make a uh, file a complaint through the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and get content taken down. And so that's often one of the most effective um, and efficient ways to get content taken down. Um, but if you are using that um, tool, you want to make sure that you collect um, evidence of it being up before you uh, make a complaint to a social media company or about copyright. Because if the content is deleted by the company, you may no longer have evidence if you want to bring um, some legal action. Um, and this is this is part of our, this is a very wordy slide. Um, this is part of our act here in Nova Scotia, which is the Intimate Images and Cyber Protection Act. 
So most statutes um, across Canada, most provinces have one um, by now, um, protect against, um, allow for a civil right of action if your nude images have been released. But here in Nova Scotia, we also include cyberbullying in it. Because again, with what happened to Retea Parson, the disclosure of her image was only one part. There was also all of this other bullying that happened. And so they include things like impersonation, um, inciting another person to commit suicide, which happened with Amanda Todd. A lot of um, her peers were telling her to kill herself, um, impersonating another person, disclosure of sensitive information, not just nude images. So there's this broad array of um, behaviors that fit with under our act. And the one thing that I think is really good about our acts is that we actually have a statutorily empowered body that's included in that act, which is basically a complex way of saying that the government has under that legislation an option um, or possibly an obligation to have a government funded body where people who have experienced cyberbullying or nude image disclosure can actually go to for support. And so you can call them, they can help you understand what technical ways you can get content removed through social media companies. They can help you manage some of the emotional or relationship challenges that you're having. Um, and then if you do decide to go um, and, and pursue a legal remedy, they can help you understand your rights. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges right now is people don't know what their rights are. They don't know where to get help. They don't understand the law. And so having these types of organizations, I think they should be across Canada. They should be better funded. They should be more well known is, is extraordinarily helpful for these types of harms. Um, Australia has the e-safety commissioner, which is the gold standard for this type of organization. Um, they have, uh, they do massive amounts of research. They do public education campaigns. They have a direct place where you can make complaints. And then that organization will actually take it out of the hands of the victim. And if they deem the content illegal or inappropriate, they'll contact the social media company and get it taken down for you. So it just relieves a lot of burden on people. And they've had a 90% success rate in getting content taken down. Most of the content they've had trouble getting taken down that was deemed harmful um, is typically on websites that aren't the major social media sites. So it'll be some random um, defamation site that's, you know, the, the websites like hosted in Lithuania, and it's just impossible to get to them legally. Um, but uh, Alexa Dodge, who is a professor at SMU here in Halifax, she did a report on CyberScan, and what she found was that very few people actually want to escalate um, what's happening to them to the law. Very few people want to report to the police. Very few people want to go through the civil route. Most people just want to get a little bit of help on how to take the content down. And for most cases that are less serious, that's all they need. And you're able to get the content taken down. But for more serious um, incidences or where people do want a legal, um, a legal response, there are options for that. But they found in interviewing, she interviewed um, people who worked for CyberScan that very few people actually wanted to escalate things to a legal response. They really just wanted emotional support and technical support. And the, according to our legislation um, and what CyberScan offers, they also offer restorative justi justice options. Um, but what um, Professor Dodge has found um, is that those haven't really been fully implemented yet. And so that's something that CyberScan in her recommendations should work um, a little bit more on making sure that there's a variety of options for people for responses. And then the pros and cons of civil law, they're the typical pros and cons that always come with civil law. The cons are it is expensive. You know, if you want to go through one of these statutes, if you want to go to the civil courts, it's going to cost you five to $20,000 easy, if not more. Um, so there's a major expense for it. The length of time, you know, if you want to have a very quick response, um, you know, and, and this litigation is going to take a year or two, it can take a while before you can get an injunction or an order to get the content taken down. The cost is inaccessible to most people, which also skews our case reporting. Um, so the cases that we're seeing right now that have been reported are generally from people who can afford lawyers, you know, and so when we're looking at who's represented as um, people who've been harmed, you know, often it's wealthier, upper class women, you know, who fit with, and they are real victims, and but also fit within this idealized version of what we think a good victim is in these types of um, both crimes and, and civil cases. And again, there's also a few lawyers who specialize in this area. I get calls all the time saying, this has happened to me. Do you know a lawyer that I can talk to? And I only know, you know, like 
very, very few lawyers to even recommend anyone to, and all those lawyers are very busy. Um, and then even if you are successful, the defendant might not have enough money to pay. You know, if it's your ex-boyfriend and your ex-boyfriend is broke, um, you're, even if you're successful, you might not get the money from them either way. But the pros is, say, if the, the defendant is um, wealthy enough to pay and you are successful and you can afford um, the law, um, you have much more control over litigation compared to using a criminal law response. Um, you can get injunctions and takedown orders sometimes before the trial is finished, which is ultimately what people are asking for. Um, you can recover costs. Um, again, as we sa I said before, you know, there's so many costs that come up with this, reputation managers, moving, um, therapy. Um, so you can get some of your costs back. And for those people who don't want to engage in the criminal law system, you can avoid um, criminalization in that situation. Uh, the final legal tool that's being considered is content moderation. And so we've seen content moderation laws be passed in other countries. So in Australia, um, they do have a civil penalty. If content isn't taken down, um, the government can um, penalize them for not taking content down. In Germany, they actually have a fairly strict content moderation laws, um, particularly around um, hate speech. Um, if content isn't taken down within 24 or 48 hours, um, depending on the content, um, the, the social media site um, can get a fine, so it incentivizes them to moderate um, content. But it's, it's also a very divisive topic um, because it implicates freedom of expression. Whenever you're having the government regulate anything where they're going to tell private companies how to moderate the content that's on their websites, um, there's always a push and pull between freedom of expression and um, protection from harms. And, and one thing that I, I think is really important to keep, keep in mind when we're thinking about freedom of expression is often we're fed this concept of freedom of expression from the United States. And freedom of expression in the United States is very different than in Canada. We have much more balancing of rights here in Canada. We have justifiable um, reasons to limit um, certain types of expression. And content moderation, depending on what's being moderated, could fit in within those justifiable balances. Because if we don't, if we don't control some of the content that's on the internet, basically what happens is that certain groups of people are unsafe on the internet. And so they are no longer able to express themselves on the internet. And so what we've seen from previous research is that um, female journalists, anyone talking about feminism, anyone talking about critical race theory, anyone talking about transgendered issues, faces extraordinary um, amounts of online harassment that's done to drive them off the internet, that's done to drive them to stop talking about what they're talking about. And so when we're thinking about freedom of expression, we need to think beyond the rights of the person who is posting harmful content and also take into consideration what are the underlying values of freedom of expression that we want to be protecting and how can we um, regulate this type of uh, behavior in a way that allows for um, a safe place to be on the internet while also not overregulating speech, which is which is a challenge. I'm sure any of these laws that are created are going to have charter challenges to them, unquestionably. Uh, and social media companies, I criticize them a lot, but they're also um, doing a lot of good work. Um, they have content moderation. They allow for blocking and muting of people, which is a tool that a lot of people use. Um, they, some um, companies have blurring images, so anyone who's used Bumble, Bumble is a dating app where you can exchange photos um, with each other, and of course sexual content is shared on that. And when it comes to unsolicited dick pics, um, there might be a conversation that you're engaged with where you get an unsolicited nude photo and you're interested in it, but the first thing that comes up is it's blurred. So if like you're in the mood for that, that's what you're looking for, you can click it and it unblurs. But if it's some jerk who's sending you a dick pic and you really don't want to see that, you can just swipe it away without having to see it. So companies are creating different tools for safety. Um, hashing has been introduced for child sexual abuse materials and nude images, where if there's um, images that have been found that are um, these types of images, they do what's called hashing, which basically creates a numerical code for the picture. And then they have that, so like Facebook or um, institutions that try and delete um, child sexual abuse material and they can use that hash to identify the image elsewhere on the site or elsewhere on the internet and then find ways just to take it down. Um, and Facebook did one thing which was controversial because it could be helpful but also was a bit weird. Um, you could preemptively send your photos. 
So like if you broke up with your ex and you were worried they were going to share your nude photos and you had all your nude photos on your phone, you could send them to Facebook and Facebook would hash the pictures so that if in the future your ex went to go post the pictures online, they already would have a hash of it and it'd be deleted immediately. But I think many of us would feel a bit uncomfortable <laughs> with sending our nudies to Facebook, but it was something they, and they try, they're trying, right? Like some companies are trying. Um, there's also filtering. Um, algorithms play a big part in how we see content, what we see on Twitter, what we see on YouTube. So they can work on their algorithms to deprioritize hateful comments, to deprioritize certain contents. Uh, Google can de-index things. So some people might be familiar with the right to be forgotten. Often what happens there is that the content will still exist on the internet, but if you search for it, so if it's your like Susie Dunn nudies, um, it won't show that. It'll just you know, show my professional profile or whatever. So it'll just be de-indexed and not on the internet. Um, and then some content moderation allows for the deletion of content and the actual removal of users. Um, like right now, we're going through a really interesting time on Twitter with the shift from Elon Musk um, purchasing Twitter again. And everyone's kind of waiting to see whether people like Trump, who you know engages in a lot of um, harmful behavior online, will be allowed back on Twitter and how they'll manage that content moderation. Um, which right now, Twitter is relatively unregulated. It's an American company that's protected by um, Section 230 of the, um, I'm drawing a blank on the, the statute, but which basically says that um, uh, internet companies can't be held liable for the content that's on their sites. And the exceptions to that are copyrightable material. So there are exceptions to this. When Elon is complaining that there are not exceptions to this, there are. Copyright um, is accepted, and they also passed two laws which were quite controversial, uh, FOSTA and SESTA, which was supposed to prevent trafficking material, um, but also led to a lot of websites just removing all nude content um, from their websites because they were worried it might be classified as trafficking material. But there have been exceptions to this. Um, but as Canada makes choices around content moderation, it'll be interesting to see how enforceable those rules will be. Um, so this is some of the recommendations that Cynthia Koo made in her report, um, deplatforming misogyny, uh, basically having requirements that platforms have easy to use, clear content moderation policies that people can understand, that are explainable, um, and that um, expedite um, the complaints well, um, that they should publish comprehensive transparency reports, because what we know right now is that content moderation policies exist but we don't know how they're making decisions. We don't know what percentage of content is actually being dealt with. Um, content moderation is often farmed out to um, contractors who their job is to look at terrible content all day long and have a few seconds to decide whether it's good or not good. Um, and obviously people make mistakes in those jobs. Um, so having more uh, comprehensive transparency reports would allow people to examine and critique um, those companies and allowing for the immediate removal of certain extremely harmful forms of content, such as non-consensual distribution and child sexual abuse material without having to get a court order. So those are some suggestions that um, LEAF uh, made. Um, and so Canada did uh, produce a technical paper um, that made uh, an initial suggestion on how to legislate this. And ultimately they were following something similar to the German model, where with these four type, five types of harms, with child sexual abuse material, non-consensual images, terrorist content, content that incites violence and hate speech, there'd be requirements to remove that content after 24 hours. Um, but when they proposed that, there was a lot of controversy around it because things like child sexual abuse materials are very easy to identify and take down, where something like hate speech or inciting violence is much more difficult um, to make an analysis on. And people were saying, should, should we be expecting social media companies to make decisions on constitutionally protected um, content um, that isn't super clear. So they went back to the drawing board. They got an expert advisory committee on online safety um, that has produced uh, some suggestions. Um, the government's now thinking about how to regulate this, but the suggestion they made was that we have a risk-based approach um, so that companies have an obligation to identify the risks that are on their platforms um, how they would mitigate those risks, and then they would have to report what they've identified and how they're mitigating those risks. And if they don't um, mitigate them well, then there might be something um, like administrative monetary penalties that the government could use to enforce um, better uh, content moderation. 
but it's a lot broader and allows for a little bit more flexibility, which there's pros and cons to all of, all of those. And then pros and cons for content moderation. You know, the pros is that it's faster, it's accessible. If you can just go to Instagram and have it dealt with then, it's much easier than going to court. Um, you know, allowing for some corporate social responsibility of these companies, I think, as a broader social goods. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, it can promote more expression if more people feel safe to communicate their views. Um, it's often the solution people want. They just want the content taken down, and it addresses some of these like awful but um, lawful contents. The cons is that to date, it hasn't been very effective. It's very burdensome for governments to enforce. When we think about this, we think of like the large players, but this law could potentially apply to thousands of websites across multiple jurisdictions, which is very legally complex. Um, the business model of a lot of these companies is not built for it. It's built on more content, more advertising. Um, so, so having enforced content moderation goes against the business model of many of these companies. So there will be resistance um, to these laws. Um, and then there's also the risk of government overreach. So the first proposal also included a lot of um, um, suggestions that the government could go then and like search Twitter's offices to get information in order to check about whether they're um, fulfilling their content moderation practices. And so there's a lot of push and pull between how much do we want to give the government um, power to access content to review whether these companies are maintaining the regulation that they should be and and not. And, hmm. and I'll just kind of like buzz through the last few. So the final piece is non-legal responses. So right now there's a few organizations in Canada that are doing really good work. Uh, the British Columbia Society of Transition Houses has a tech safe website, tech safety website, where you can go on there. They've got tips on cybersecurity, how to protect your privacy, um, how to collect um, digital evidence. And it's written up for people who are likely going to be self-represented in court. Um, so it's it's very accessible. And then for lawyers who are unfamiliar um, or who like want to uh, learn a bit more about digital evidence collection or or uh, or law students, it's a really accessible resource to get. It is limited to British Columbia. Uh, Rhiannon Wong, who is the person who headed this project, um, has been hired by um, Women's Shelter Canada to expand expand this across Canada. But it's a it's a fabulous resource that I recommend people going to if you want um, to learn a bit about tech safety, even if you're not threatened by stalking or harassment. It's just really good on how to make sure you've got good passwords and how to check to see if other people are accessing your email or your phone. There's really easy ways to, to figure that out that we often don't look into. How to turn off your location tracking. The YMCA or YWCA and Media Smarts is also doing a lot of great work in this area. If you work with any young people, if you have kids, this is an amazing guide. It's a guide for trusted adults. A lot of parents um, didn't necessarily grow up with the internet in their own lives and are now raising children with the internet. Um, and it's hard, you know, to figure out how to do that well. And so the YWCA created this amazing guide to learn how to talk to kids um, about um, online safety and, and privacy. And they've, they've also just done a lot of youth-based research that's uh, extraordinarily helpful. Um, and this is just a list of some Canadian resources and international resources. I generally, like, as I come across things, I post them on my website. So I've got a website, suzydunn.com. And if you just go to the resources section, I've got all these community organizations and cybersecurity organizations that have how-to tips on them. So if you're interested in any of that, I keep an ongoing list. I don't update it all the time, so I can't promise whether it's um, totally up to date. But there's so many resources um, out there um, that people can access. Okay, so thank you so much. We're almost at seven. I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions. So um, thanks for coming. Any questions? Yes. Do you think the fact that um, technology, the tech field is a male dominated um, area is uh, like, what do you see that as impacting that? Field? Yeah. So it really contributes to it. So what we see is that um, in most large tech companies, we see predominantly men, uh, male engineers who are developing and producing um, these products. And there's certain things where you just think, man, if there had been a woman in the room or a racialized person in the room, you know, we would have known that like Apple AirTags could be used to stalk 
women. Um, you know, and so, so I think that there is a bit of an issue within tech companies that they don't have enough um, people who are not just represented by their identity. Like I think putting women into tech companies doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Like you need to have people who are committed to equality issues and who are committed um, to thinking about um, how to make products safe and how to make them good. And so some practices um, that companies have, they have privacy by design. So every time you're creating um, new tech, you should be running through how to ensure privacy is protected. And now there's pushes for, for safety by design as well, too. So thinking about actually having a process where people have to think through those um, those issues. And, and I think there's also a pipeline issue where a lot of computer science engineers don't have um, this type of knowledge in their education in the way that like as lawyers like we have to take legal education and legal ethics courses you know and but in uh, in engineering right now a lot of those um, issues that have to do specifically with tech safety are still optional and so i think there's also a need to change how we educate um, computer science engineers so that when they do get access to creating technology that they're more thoughtful about it and women be, women are not like women who are have startups the rate of venture capitalists who are funding um, women's um, uh, startup ideas is, is is so small, like so 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 small. If you're a woman heading a company trying to get money for it, it's very difficult, and and especially if they have to do with safety or equality, it's it's really difficult to get funding. And you'll see men creating apps like, and there are lots of great men in tech. I don't want to, you know, harp on that too much, but um, but there's certain examples of things like I've seen funding for an app where they wanted to um get around, not get around, but they wanted to digitize consent. So basically when you're dating someone before you have any sexual interaction with them, you'd sit down on an app, you'd put like what your sexual preferences are on a blockchain or, you know, some sort of thing. And then if either person like breached the contract, there'd be a technical solution for it. But like, we all know that like sexual consent is ongoing and it doesn't matter if you fill anything out on an app, this is not going to get around. <laughs> Consent, right? And that, like, and those kinds of things get funded, um, which blow, which blows my mind. So I do think there are some issues with the tech industry where they need to work a lot more on uh, on improving the the technology they're creating. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to um, deepfakes and what kind of legal recourse you could throw in there. Like it seems to me copyright is sort of the only applicable one and we know this is an increasing issue for like yeah. non celebrity, non public figure ones. Yeah, it's really hard. And so and the thing with copyrights the people who are probably going to be most successful on a copyrights um, complaint with deepfakes are the people who are the bodies in the videos. And so this has been an issue that's come up as well too. A lot of sex workers and porn performers are saying like they're also um, being harmed by deepfakes because their content is being um, having someone else's face put on it and being misrepresented. But really the base of the person would be easier to make a copyright complaint because deepfakes you have to have a large collection of someone's image to make a, a, a like a mock-up of their face to be uh, put on, but you can't really tell from a deep fake which photos have been used. And so even though there might be a misuse of copyrightable images in that content, it's much harder to make a copyright complaint. So in a lot of other countries, um, they have altered images included in their non-consensual distribution laws. So their civil laws and their criminal laws include things like deep fakes. There was a woman, Noelle Martin, who had um, a lot of her images photoshopped and then later on deep faked. And she actually became a law student, became a lawyer and did a ton of legal advocacy in Australia. And so a lot of the laws in Australia include altered images. And here in Canada, I believe in New Brunswick, our civil, um, the civil statute there does include altered images. I'd have to double check that. But um, it, when they were proposing their statute, they had included altered images. So that's one place for it to be connected. And then um, under civil um, uh, personality rights torts, um, you can also capture them. But the challenge with personality right torts is that in, in certain jurisdictions, it leans a little bit more heavily to commercial content. Like it's meant to not have your pictures be in an ad. Um, um, so depending on what province you're in, you might have more success if it's been sold, so like if your image has been sold, but a lot of um, deepfake pornography is just made for fun. 
you know, and there, and no one's really making money off of it. So it doesn't necessarily fit perfectly under those laws. So, and so, and that's an area where I think there's a gap where like, what about our faces? What about our voices? What about our identities um, need to be protected from, from deep fake technology? Because voices have been used as well, not so much in this context, but people have deep faked people's voices and called up a CEO at a company and said, hey, I'm your boss, you know, can you transfer $500,000 into another account? And the voice is so convincing that they do, you know, and so stealing people's voices and images and faces is a, a, a new issue around fraud as well. But, but that would likely fit under fraud laws. Yeah. Yeah. I just have a question around how victims that are outside of Canada, the perpetrators are in Canada. Like, yeah. Is there like a barrier for those victims getting justice? Yeah, I think it would be it would basically be the flip side of what happened with Amanda Todd. You know, so you'd be able to see because the crime, and this is the interesting thing about tech, right? Because like, where does the where does the crime occur? And so the crime can occur in the jurisdiction that they're in, but it also could occur here. And so there was one case in um, British Columbia where it was a woman whose husband um, created a whole fake website of her. It was like her first and last name.com and published all this harassing information about her and untrue information. And she initially called the BC police to say, you know, I'm being harassed by my ex, but I live in the United States. And they were like, not our jurisdiction, not our problem. Um, and then she went to the States and she said, this issue is happening to me. And they're like, no, 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 that, that issue is happening in Canada, not our issue, go to Canada. And again, it was one of these um, difficult situations where she ended up going to the media. And then when it went to the media, um, she was able to get the Canadian um, police to take it seriously. And at first, again, they were a bit wishy-washy on the harassment charge, because for harassment, you have to have a sense of fear. Um, so it has to be like repeated harmful behavior that causes you fear. And there was also some question around, well, can she actually be afraid if he's in Canada and she's in the United States? And eventually they were very, they were successful and, and he did get charged with, um, with criminal harassment. But then the challenge with him as well, too, is once he got out of, um, once he got out of jail, um, he just put the website back up and it's, you know, and he just doesn't, he just doesn't care. Um, at all either. And so there's these issues, even if you have court orders and people are flaunting them, like how do you get content taken down off the internet? But but it is a challenge. Jurisdiction's a major issue. Yeah. That actually triggered a response that triggered a lot of question for me, which is, I can't really ask the question, I'm only so against the international law. Yeah, yeah. Do you think, given the ubiquity of the internet, mm -hmm. how accessible it can be, basically from anywhere, mm -hmm. to anywhere, and that people use uh, virtual network networks to ask where they're coming from, do you think there's any appetite at all for international action on this? Like some kind of body that might start small, European, American, Canadian, but could grow large to solve some of these yeah. problems, have a uniform, sort yeah. of uniform remedy, whether it's criminal civil or, or class moderation that gets over this jurisdictional challenge. Like, is there any appetite, do you think, for so international regulation of this stuff? For child sexual abuse material, there unquestionably is. Like there's international organizations, they share material with each other, they share things with, you do see a real movement on child sexual abuse material. And with tech facilitated violence, just in the last like four or five years, we've seen a lot more attention by the UN. Like there's been a few, um, like just recently I got invited to be on a global um, committee with a few different countries that are looking to talk about these issues. So I think there's an appetite to think about it and to talk about it. And I think there is a model with child sexual abuse material that's already been implemented. But again, that's the one issue that everybody's everybody dislikes that. You know, like when we talk about that material, there's no question it is wrong. Um, but other things like even releasing um, adult images of people, like there's not a consistent response across the board. And so you have to get buy-in from all these different countries, which I think will be a challenge. But I but I do think with the internet there is, um, and these tech facilitated crimes, there is much more of a need to get um, international, even to have consistency in like what the laws look like could be helpful so that people don't have to think, you know, do I have to go to Canada to get this dealt with if the person's there or, or can I do it within my own jurisdiction? But I, I think there is an appetite for international conversation and we'll, and we'll see where that goes. Okay, well, it's seven now, so unless anyone has one more burning question, we'll let you get back into the rain. Okay, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>